Good morning. Thank you, Joanna. Hopefully she can hear me. Good to see you this morning. We uh, enjoyed yesterday the Crosswave Surfing Ministry, first time since pre-COVID we've had the opportunity. I didn't realize we had so many young surfers. I use that word young as a sarcastic young. We, young surfers in our church. It was great to see people that were my age out there, but not surfing, watching and encouraging. So, And I uh, understand, you, you know, the, that you saw the video advertising the ministry tonight, and uh, I'd like to ask you to pray for my wife and I. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I'll say no more. Andrew encouraged Andrew encouraged us to do this, and uh, I'm glad he has confidence. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be great. Here's the whole thing. Be sure to marry up. <laughs> Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. And I pray that your word will have its intended purpose on us today, that it will be used of you to cause us to bear fruit, that our life would extend beyond us and even beyond our life if you tarry on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. How does it make you feel when you go somewhere and you really feel like somebody's really glad to see you? How does it make you feel? Well, I don't need to ask for an answer to that question. I know how it makes you feel. It, it, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? And I believe that that betrays the fact that deep inside the human psyche and deep inside our soul and the way we're wired is everybody wants to be wanted. Everybody wants to be wanted. So a follow-up question might be, how well do, do you welcome people into your life? You know, the Bible says that give and it shall be given unto you, the measure you use shall be measured to you. So how well do we welcome people into our life? and affirm that they're wanted. Perhaps that might be a clue as to how we answer the first question. But in the end, the most important thing is what does God want us to want? And what about our lives proves that we want to please God and, and we want to make God welcome in our life I think that's a question that the scriptures answer for us today and we're looking <clears throat> in Mark chapter 4 today as the year of the evangelist we've been going through Matthew through Acts and for a few weeks here we're using the scripture that's a part of today's reading in the yearly reading through those passages that's today Mark 4 is the passage we're reading today. And so a section of that chapter, and we're going to use that scripture for our message today. Beginning with verse 1. Again, he began to teach by the sea, and a very large crowd gathered around him. So he got into a boat on the sea and sat down, while the whole crowd was on the shore facing the sea. I recall... Um, many years ago, back in the 80s, Pam and I lived in, with family in Georgia and pastored the church there in Augusta, Georgia. And our church, the local church, we had a camp on what was then called Clarks Hill Lake. It's a large uh, Corps of Engineers impoundment. I'm not sure. I think they changed the name. But anyway, the church had a camp there. A local church and we had you know a boat dock a boat launch ramp cabins picnic shelter bathhouse a whole deal so we would go up as a church and have activities up there occasionally 
And one of the things that I enjoyed doing was on one or two occasions, went down, we had a group and we had a message and I would get in a boat out on the lake and have all the church folks stand on the bank and preach to them in light of Jesus. But what even was better than that is across the lake on the South Carolina side, there was a church in South Carolina that had property that was a cove in the lake. In other words, there, you know, it was like a, a narrow entrance in a big area outside the main lake, like a harbor, so to speak. And what they did is they built a platform uh, for preaching and leading on the side of the bank up from the lake and then they used the whole cove as the place for the congregation. So they would advertise on the lake. On Sunday, people are out in their boats on the lake, and they advertise, come to church. And so it was not drive-in church, but boat-in church. And they had the whole cove just filled with boats and while they preached and led the service. It was great. So Jesus often did this, and not only was it convenient, but I'm sure that the water helped amplify his voice as well. He taught them many things in parables. Now, parables are a teaching technique of Jesus. It's literally a word that sounds like the original word, from the original into English, and it's a word that means to set beside or to compare. To set beside or to compare. And what we need to understand about the parables of Jesus as he taught in parables is that he always used stories that were related to real-life experiences, but he didn't use specific individuals' names, and they didn't come from specific events in real life. Uh, the stories were crafted to make the spiritual point and they came out of real life, but they weren't necessarily a real-life event, a historical event. And he always, the way you distinguish a parable is he never names someone as a person or an individual. He always gives them a title consistent with what their role was in life. Okay? Now, that being said, is that in his teaching, he taught to them, he, t he said, said to them, Listen, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, this occurred. Now, again, you see here a sower. I mean, this could be God. Uh, this could be you or me, as we'll see a little, bit a little bit later, as he explains it. But it's like a sower who went out to sow, not, not a certain person who went out to sow. And, and the other thing about parables that we need to do is not over-allegorize. In other words, one of the mistakes I think that people make is trying to find a nuance of meaning in every little detail and come up with some meaning. Now, there's, there's one main point that Jesus is trying to teach, and, and we need to get that point from the parable, and that's the focus that he's giving us. As he sowed, this occurred. Some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it sprang up right away since it didn't have deep soil. When the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it didn't have a root, it withered. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it didn't produce a crop. Still others fell on good ground and produced a crop that increased 30, 60, and 100 times what was sown. Then he said, anyone who has ears to hear should listen. Now, the next, the next line is a transition as to who would have ears to hear. When he was alone with the 12, in other words, the 12 disciples whom he had named apostles, when he was alone with them, those who were around him asked him about the parables. He answered them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those outside, everything comes in parables so that they may look and look, yet not perceive. They may listen and listen, yet not understand. Otherwise, they might turn back and be forgiven. Now, he's quoting from Isaiah the prophet here about his teaching and the question that it, that it begs is 
does this mean Jesus is trying to hide God's truth? Because that certainly appears to be the case. Well, my response to that would be, based on the context and based on the bigger picture, is that no, he's not trying to hide God's truth, but he is revealing a basic principle in what it means to hear God's truth. And that is, Jesus is explaining to those who prove they believe by following him. He explains the parable in detail for them. What am I getting at? Here's a basic premise in life with God. As you look at the panorama of the whole Bible, is that the world says, and our whole desire and instinct as people is to say, we need to understand something before we accept it or believe it. Understanding precedes belief in the value system of the world. But with God, belief precedes understanding. In other words, you've got to believe it in order to understand it. Did I hear a familiar voice with that amen? That was a Juan Sally amen. There's Juan Sally back there. Hey, I, I thought I recognized that voice. <laughs> uh, you can't. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, but, but it, that's the way it works. And so I think that's what is playing out here in this parable. And that is that Jesus is not trying to hide from anybody. It's just that if we don't have confidence in God and in His Word, then we don't have a chance of understanding His Word. In other words, when, when I read a passage in the Bible that I don't understand, which is 90% of the Bible that I read, can anybody say amen to that? That doesn't mean that I doubt it. I, I take it by confidence that our God is reliable, that it's true and there's not a problem with it. If there's a problem, the problem's with me, not with the text. And it's only by God's grace that we have the capacity, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to understand God's truth. So I think Jesus teaching in parables and his explanation of that is what verifies that value system with Christ that we need to be aware of. Now, so Jesus then goes on and explains the meaning of the parable in detail to them. Then he said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any of the parables? The sower sows the word. Now, what, what we can glean from this, back to the sower, that could be God, that could be you, that could be me. The word is God's word. I think that's a safe, that's a safe conclusion based on the context. It's God's word is given to people, and it's a seed. And other places... In the Bible, seed is used as a metaphor for God's Word, other places in the Bible as well. These are the ones along the path where the Word is sown. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the Word sown in them. So in other words, the, the illustration is here of a hard piece of ground that hasn't been tilled, that hasn't been prepared, and the seed is just laying on top of the ground, <clears throat> and maybe a wind comes and blows it away, a bird comes and picks it up. The idea is the ground is not prepared for the seed, therefore the seed doesn't germinate and have a chance to bear fruit. And he says that in the case of that kind of experience, the person who heard the word, the devil comes and takes it away before it has a chance to germinate. Now, let me expand on that a little bit because I think that's relevant because how, how is that possible for Satan to do that? How would that happen? Well, let me suggest a couple of examples as to how that would happen. The first thing that we need to say about that, I think, is this. 
is that James 4, 7 says, read it with me, James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, this is an absolute promise. And the only condition here is that we submit to God and resist the devil. If we do that, then the devil has to go. Here's the first thing to understand. Satan has no power in anybody's life that is not given to him. In other words, Satan has no ability to impact anybody unless somebody gives over power to him and opens the door to him in their life. Satan does not have the power to force himself upon anybody. And conversely, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you means anybody that submits to God and resists the devil always has more power than the devil in their own life. Hebrews 10, 13, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. But with the temptation will provide a way out that you may successfully resist it, bear up under it. Now, the idea is this. That's the first truth. The second truth is, though, that we can allow the enemy to influence our lives by doing things that the Bible clearly indicates give the devil a foothold in our lives. First, when Ephesians chapter 4 talks about unresolved anger and bitterness over either perceived or real injustices committed against us, the Bible says, uh, be angry and don't sin, and don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, don't hold on to resentment and bitterness um, and a vengeful attitude because it goes on to say that in that you'll give a foothold to the devil a root of bitterness defiles many the Bible says the, the, so if, if we've got some sort of unresolved injustice that we can't let go of and we develop a bitter spirit because of it then that's going to give the devil a foothold in our lives. That's just what the Bible says. Now, that being said, I'm looking forward this summer, June, July, and August, It's because we're dealing with Matthew through uh, John, then we're doing a series on forgiveness throughout that section, and we'll talk about some of these things in greater detail. We're looking forward to that. But, but if we have unresolved anger and resentment because of real or perceived injustices and develop a bitter spirit that gives the devil influence in our life we got to let go of it got to let go of it secondly in galatians chapter 5 we don't have time i'm not going to take the time to go and read that that whole passage you can look it up later but from the middle of that chapter on to the end then paul contrasts what it looks like to walk in the flesh and what it looks like to walk in the spirit he gives a contrast there and when he talks about walking in the flesh then he that people who will not inherit the kingdom of god that he says that plainly he gives a, a litany of all these characteristics of a person who's not walking in the spirit and he talks about sexually immoral he talks about drunkenness, people that, that are, that are a, a, addicted to alcohol, drunkenness. He talks about um, sorcery and witchcraft. Now, that, that's interesting because that word sorcery, and, and several other things he mentions, but you read it yourself. That word sorcery or witchcraft is a translation of an original word it refers to occult practices because in the day of Paul in the New Testament, occult practices involved usage of drugs because the word behind that in the original is the word pharmakia from which we get the word, thank you, and what do you get at pharmacies? Hello. 
Okay, I only found two English Bible translations that actually use drug use there. But I think that for our context, it's the most appropriate translation. So anybody that uses mind-altering substances, i.e. drugs, in a way that is designed to do what they do, is throwing the door open and inviting Satan to come in and take over my life. Because Satan runs that business. That is his domain. And oh, by the way, in the United States, we're legalizing recreational marijuana. Well, there's a contradictory phrase, recreational marijuana. Bull. It's godless, and it's satanic, and anybody that claims to follow Jesus and deals with that stuff is deceived. Period. That, there is, that, that, that's not, a, that's not a, even a, a nego- negotiable or discussable point. End of story. And all, listen, I heard the other day, you, you know, I believe everything I hear on the news and on the internet. <laughs> but, but I heard the other day that there was enough fentanyl smuggled into America last year to literally kill every person living in the United States. Now, you tell me the devil's not behind that? Give me a break. He's he's about death and evil. God is about goodness and life. Period. And and so, what I'm I'm trying to get at, how is the the word that's on heart, how is the devil catch it away? When we open the door to the devil... When people open the door to the devil by the practices of their life, then they give devil, the devil an entree. But submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to quit preaching. Let's go to the next one. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. But they have no root in themselves. They are short-lived. When pressure or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately stumble. And then others are sown among thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the worries of this age, the seduction of wealth, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now, let me just briefly mention, I think, what a manifestation of that is is how the influence of the world affects the role of God's Word in our life. And I think we see this in spades. We see this in spades. All the conflict and the turmoil and the divisiveness we have politically and socially and otherwise that are going on in this country right now. And everybody on every side of whatever position wants to claim some biblical justification for their opinions or their actions. I'm, I'm right now in, in still working on a book uh, that's long but very interesting on the role of the Bible in the Civil War. It is fascinating. The guy that did the research on this book, hats off. I, the thousands of, of original document references... And this guy, what he does, he pieces together excerpts from speeches and sermons and everything, and how from 1860 to 1865 in America, how in the Civil War there would be a sermon by a preacher in the North preaching from a certain passage of the Bible. And using that passage to support and reinforce the Northern cause there was at the same time a pastor in the South preaching that same sermon, and he takes excerpts from that sermon, that same passage, and the guy uses it to justify the Southern cause. In other words, they take the same passage from the Bible and turn it on its head in in ways that 
just accommodates their preconceived notion. All I'm saying to you is this, is it's fine for everybody to have opinions, but do not let your opinions or your preferences influence your understanding of the Word of God. What it means to live by the Bible is let the Bible stand on its own two legs and let it make the decisions for us. That's what it means. And a great illustration of this back, uh, in fact, we were uh, at, back in Georgia, the same church I referenced earlier when Pam and I were there back in the 80s. And I remember being in a Sunday school class one Sunday morning and a lady was in there, and a sweet lady, she was a real, uh, uh, really big on inductive Bible study and did, you know, led Bible study and whatever, whatever, and, and did a great job. Well, we were on a passage in one of the Gospels where it talked about Jesus doing something, and this just did not fit with her narrative. Whatever Jesus did and whatever we plainly saw that he did, it just didn't fit with her preconceived notion of who Jesus should be. Even though it was impossible to deny what the text was saying, it wasn't a complicated text at all. And she wouldn't accept it. She just said, I, you know, I know what it says, but I don't believe that's what Jesus meant here. Because she had a preconceived notion as to what she, regardless of what the Bible confirmed. So what I'm saying is that's another way that we allow the world to influence our understanding of the Bible. And we, we have to fight that. We have to fight that. So... Lastly, we get to verse 20 and the crux of the matter. Here's where we land today. See, there's really only two kinds of soil. There's four mentioned, but there's only two kinds. There's unfruitful and fruitful. And I think that you, like me, want to be the latter, not the former. I think you want to be fruitful. I think you want the Word of God to bear fruit in your life. And the way I'm looking at this is kind of like the old saying about the counterfeit expert. You've heard that, haven't you? That the person that's an expert in counterfeit money, that they don't try to learn all the different ways it's counterfeited. They just become totally familiar with the real thing so that if there's any anomaly, if there's anything out of line, they immediately pick up on it. Well, I want to be totally familiar with the fruitful soil. Because that's what I want to focus on. I want to find out what Jesus is talking about. And here's the line. Read it with me. But these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. Now, if we could leave that verse up there for just a minute, please. And notice... There's a word here that I think is the key to unlocking everything Jesus is teaching here about fruitful soil. And that's the word that's rendered there in that line, accept. Accept. That word is the key. What, what does it mean to accept God's word? Well, if you look at different English Bible versions that you, you and I have, a lot of them will say, receive it. So I did a little homework, and I dug a little deeper with that word. What I discovered was that accept and receive was a, a primary rendering of that word, but it was used throughout the New Testament in different ways. And guess what? <coughs> when Paul talks in Ephesians 6 about the armor of God, and he talks about putting on the armor of God, and he talks about, he says, take the helmet of salvation... That word take, same exact word. Same word. Furthermore, it's also used, Acts 15, 3 and 4, talking about Paul and his companions going back to Jerusalem. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, explaining in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they created great joy among all the brothers. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were... Same word. Same word. They were welcomed by the church. That's the same word. 
So that really started me digging. I started looking through all the Bible translations I could find, and guess what? I ran across this one. Look at it with me, 420. Read it with me. But the ones sowed on good ground are those who hear the word, welcome it, and produce a crop 30, 60, and 100 times what was sown. Folks, I believe that that catches the gist of what Jesus is getting at here the best. Jesus is talking about not a bland reception of God's Word or an acknowledgement. He's talking about wanting God's Word. He's talking about wanting it to be wanted in our lives. He's talking about embracing God's Word. That is what makes us bear fruit a hundred times. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of the Messiah. You see, faith is inseparable from the Bible. If, if you want faith that pleases God, you've got to be trusting what the Bible says. And that means not just acknowledging it, but living it. You've got to be trusting what the Bible says. And here's the idea, is that not only do we trust, but to welcome God's Word and to be fruitful soil is that we don't just acquiesce to the Bible. Yeah, okay, well, yeah. No, I want what the Bible wants for me. I want what God wants because the Bible communicates what God wants for our life. So in order for me to be fruitful, then I need to be wanting the Word of God in my life. People who bear fruit live based on the Bible. That means, functionally, they live by faith. The simple difference between fruitful and unfruitful soil is one simple thing. True faith based on the Word of God. And faith is measured by how much you want the Bible to determine your decisions. I, you know, let me, let, me, let, me use a couple of, let me use a couple of examples. I've never taken business classes in school, and I've never been a businessman. Many of you are businesswomen and businessmen, and you've taken classes, so you can check me on this. I'm willing to bet that there's not a business school in the world that would ever teach that the way to be successful in business is give it away. You want to get rich? Impoverish yourself. Is that... Do you think that's... Do you think that's a common strategy in business in America today or in the world or ever? Well, folks, my Bible says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down. Bible says that the way we receive is we give. Now, I don't know anybody that would say that that's rational or it's recommended in any worldly sense. <coughs> That's straight out of the Bible. And to live by faith is to not go with what makes sense to us, but what the Bible promises. So when we do that, we're living by faith saying, God, I have confidence in you that you don't make promises you don't keep. This doesn't make sense to me, but I'm going to trust that when I do this, I'm putting myself under your care and your control, and I'm trusting you to carry me through. You see, that's an example of what it means to welcome the Word of God and to want what God wants, in, even if it contradicts what makes sense to us. And the last... The last example I'll use is, I don't know how many of us have ever had the opportunity to go into a, a Jewish synagogue worship service. 
If you've ever had that opportunity, you'll be familiar with what I'm talking about, I'm sure. My experience has been in a messianic context where there are Jews that believe in Jesus, and, but the synagogue service and the liturgy is all the same. It's just, you know, with Jesus, obviously. But there's a point in the service where the leader of the service, the rabbi, whoever the chief officiant is, is they go up to the ark, that's what they call the, the cabinet where the scroll is contained. And they pull out the Torah, great big scrolls, pull them out, and they put them on their shoulder because they're big to carry. And then you know what they do? Everybody's standing, and I guess they're singing or doing something in the background. And then the leader walks through the whole congregation, up and down the aisles, the whole congregation. The leader walks with that Torah, the Word of God, walks through the aisles. Everybody is up, and they move to the aisle. Everybody moves to the aisle. And everybody gets within arm's length at least. In the Messianic context, when, when I was exposed to it, we did it, you, people would take their Bible and touch it. Or people would take the, if they, if they had the prayer shawl, they would take the talit and touch it. But what the real expression was is you got close enough and you kissed it. You kissed the Word of God. Now, I know that that has become ritual. I understand how things in time can just become habitual practice. Without, but folks, that had a start somewhere. God's people welcomed God's Word. And when God's Word came in the door, they kissed it. Just like you... You grab a, a long-lost child and kiss them when they walk in your door because you welcome the Word of God. If you want your life to bear fruit now and forever, welcome the Word of God.